Good afternoon. Really? That's the way you want to start the school year? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. On behalf of the faculty, staff, and administration of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, ranked for the second year in a row as a top school for undergraduate teaching, and for the second year in a row as the number one up-and-coming university in the United States. <laughs> Welcome to UMBC's 2010 convocation. Please rise for the singing of our national anthem as led by the UMBC Camerata and Wind Ensemble under the direction of Dr. Stephen Carol Cholo. Gentlemen, please remove your caps or hats during the anthem. Please be seated. It is with great pleasure that I introduce one of my favorite people at UMBC, my friend and a friend to all UMBC students, Dr. Diane Lee, UMBC's Vice Provost and Dean of Undergraduate Education. Dr. Lee oversees the development and delivery of programs that enrich the undergraduate educational experience. Examples include the introduction to an honors university course, the Undergraduate Research and Creative Achievement Day, the Learning Resources Center, and the Women's Center. In 1997, Dr. Lee was honored as the Presidential Teaching Professor and is a faculty member in the Department of Education and has worked at UMBC for 20 years. Please welcome Dr. Lee to the stage. Thank you, good afternoon. This is going to be a great class of 2014. The poet Wallace Stevens writes about six significant landscapes, and each landscape describes a way of being in the world. In the last stanza, he asks us to let go of certainty and to be willing to break down the barriers that separate us from one another. The last stanza reads as follows. Rationalists wearing square hats think in square rooms, looking at the floor, looking at the ceiling. They confine themselves to right-angled triangles. If they tried rhomboids, cones, waiting lines, ellipses, as, for example, the ellipse of the half moon, rationalists would wear sombreros. Stevens encourages us to look afar, beyond the boundaries suggested by science, language, social status, religion, culture, age, race, and the like. Indeed, by letting go of squares and right-angle triangles, the suggestion is that we can, and actually we should, be open to one another, to new ideas, and to all kinds of experiences. It is important to note that Stevens is not insisting that we give up our beliefs or abandon altogether our long-held explanation of people and things. In fact, he is asking only that we be interested in what someone else believes, that we listen, listen attentively and seek to understand ideas different from our own. At the same time, however, we have to assert a willingness to have our thoughts, our beliefs, and our opinions out there and even challenged. And this is not easy to do. 
Indeed, it is difficult to call into question that which we hold true. Importantly, in Stephen's verse, it is not sufficient to doubt or just to question. He calls upon us to recapture the joy, the excitement, and the sheer delight of discovery. And this is an invitation to each of you here at UMBC. Look at those things that are familiar to you as if you were seeing them and experiencing them for the very first time. Allow your emotions to be aroused by what you know, as well as by those things that remain mysterious and maybe even troublesome. If Stevens were here today, I'm sure he would ask all of us to set ourselves free of self-imposed limits and mind-numbing restrictions. He would remind us that it is okay to be disturbed, perplexed, and even confused at times, because it's often in those moments that we dream, that we embrace curiosity, that we engage and give rein to our imagination. So welcome to UMBC. We encourage you to playfully and willingly put on a sombrero. By doing so, you will create a thoughtful landscape here on this campus for the growth of your mind, your heart, and perhaps even your soul. Class of 2014, welcome to UMBC. You really made the best choice. <laughs> See, the absent-minded professor. <laughs> it is actually my honor to be able to introduce our provost, Dr. Elliot Hirschman. He has been a wonderful leader, colleague, and friend to all of us at UMBC. Dr. Hirschman. Good afternoon, and thank you, Dean Lee, for those thought-provoking words. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to UMBC's academic community. Convocation is a special time, a time of great promise, and we're extremely pleased to have you join us here tonight. During your time here, you'll grow intellectually. You'll gain knowledge and wisdom. You'll also grow personally. You'll make friends and become a member of our broader community. In short, you'll have experiences that will change the rest of your life. There will, of course, be challenging moments. I can assure you that there will be challenges on tests and everyone won't go exactly as you anticipated. In these moments, I hope you'll remember that you come here with a strong foundation. You bring experiences and perspectives that will allow you to meet these challenges and make your own unique contribution to UMBC. I want to spend my time talking about the most important practical thing that you can do here at UMBC, which is to engage in the study of the liberal arts and sciences. Yours is a generation that has grown up in the midst of significant challenges. Homeland security, the economy, the environment, healthcare, just to name a few. These have been part of your daily life for as long probably as you can remember. They're the challenges for the current generation, and they're also your challenges as future leaders. To meet these challenges, you're going to have to be problem solvers. You're going to have to think critically and creatively. You'll have to communicate effectively. You'll have to be scientifically and quantitatively literate. And you'll have to be able to understand issues across local, national, and international boundaries. These are exactly the qualities and characteristics that education in the liberal arts and sciences fosters. At UMBC, our general education program features two components. The first component is a broad, multidisciplinary approach featuring courses in the arts, humanities, social sciences, and natural mathematical sciences. The second component is your disciplinary major that gives you an in-depth approach to a specific subject. Through your major, you'll learn about your field's history, its methodology, and its contemporary issues. We believe that this combination of depth and breadth is essential for preparing you as a future leader. For example, what could have been more practical and important than an understanding our current economic challenges than knowing about our economy, our political system, and the psychology of investors and of groups? Similarly, when we think about a problem like global warming, 
seemingly intractable. We're going to have to bring together creativity from the arts, communication abilities from the humanities, the basic measurement ca capabilities from the sciences and, the, and mathematics, and then finally, policy issues from the social sciences. These examples and many, many others illustrate the power of the liberal arts and sciences. Through this approach, our goal is to educate you as leaders who will think creatively and critically, who will communicate effectively, who will work with diverse groups, and who ultimately will solve our society's pressing problems. In this context, it's not a coincidence that the word liberal and the phrase liberal arts and sciences and the phrase the word liberate to set free share the same Latin root, liberare. Thus, our goal is for your education in the liberal arts and sciences to empower you, to set you free, to solve broad societal problems. With this important goal in mind, I again welcome you to UMBC. We look forward to supporting you as you develop as an engaged member of our community. Thank you. It's now my pleasure to introduce Yasmin Karimian, the president of the SGA. Yasmin is a double major in political science and psychology, and she plans to enroll in law school following graduation. Please join me in welcoming Yasmin to the podium. Once again, good afternoon and welcome. Welcome not to just this very special ceremony, but welcome to our community, to our home, to our UMBC. I'm very excited that you're here. My name is Yasmin Karamian, and I'm your Student Government Association President. SGA President, you're probably thinking that I'm a very outgoing person who made friends as soon as I entered here three years ago. Yet coming from a high school that the graduating class was about 130 girls, UMBC seemed like a huge school. Like some of you, I was incredibly nervous about making friends in this large environment. I actually became so worried that I didn't make an effort to put myself out there. I spent most nights alone in my room, and even as I saw how much goes on on campus, I was always too worried about not knowing someone at an event. I spent my first semester becoming best friends with Psych 100, and I bet I could beat all of you in a game of Tetris. I'm an expert on nervousness and shyness, and when I began here, I thought that I could not contribute much to this community and was not an essential part of UMBC. Even as I have begun to overcome my apprehensions, having brought them to UMBC has helped me connect with and help other reserve students have who have come here after me. It has been a source of my contribution. Each of you is an essential part of our UMBC and bring different qualities and experiences. I encourage you to reflect on what you bring and how you can contribute. We pride ourselves on being one of the most diverse campuses in the nation, but our diversity is extraordinary because it goes beyond traditional concepts of the word embodied in race, sexual orientation and gender. Our diversity is made up of the very stories that fill this room. Learning at UMBC is not just in the classroom, but in each meaningful conversation that you will have. Be open and honest, challenge yourself to share and get to know those around you, not only your fellow classmates, but everyone you work with, like your professors and RA, RAs. This is such a part of UMBC that today, you'll actually get to see one of our traditions where we invite one of our faculty members to share their story with you. And Professor Salkind will be doing so in a few moments. But today will not be the only day that you will share your stories or have stories be told to you. Conversations and learning will not end after your first year. I spent this last week with members of the SGA, and through meaningful conversations, I learned so much more around, about the people around me and myself. One of the members has been in the Air Force and attended four different schools until he found UMBC to be the school for him. It's at UMBC that he can pursue his passion.
sustainability of the earth. It's at UMBC that he can it's at UMBC where he can be an INDS major, taking a multifaceted approach to studying sustainability. Another recently lost his parent, but has incredible strength to stay motivated and happy. These are just two of the 50 stories that I had the chance to hear, and you will have many opportunities to do the same. Curtis and Caroline, two incredible students here, will be sharing their experiences with you in just a little bit. Each of you can learn from others' stories, and their stories can contribute to your life and your experience here. Making the most of the stories that you hear and the opportunities that you have will make you stronger and certainly more ready to take on any challenge that you face. The opportunities and relationships found at UMBC allow a small town girl from Moncton, Maryland, who rarely raised her hand in class to speak in front of you today. Entering my senior year, I know that UMBC has truly made me the person I am. There is really no way of predicting what your experience will be at UMBC, but whatever your experience may be, it will be an incredible journey, I promise you that. Thank you. As I mentioned earlier, it's one of our traditions at UMBC to invite the current presidential teaching professor recipient to address new students. The Presidential Teaching Award, honoring exemplary dedication and achievements, is given to just one faculty member each year. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce Ms. Wendy Salkind, Associate Professor of Theater and recipient of the 2010 Presidential Teaching Award. Pro <laughs> Professor Salkind is an extraordinary educator and mentor to students, as well as an internationally recognized actor. A demanding and rigorous teacher, she expects success from her students and gives them individualized attention. She is committed to continually enhancing the curriculum of theater, the theater department. While chair, she worked with faculty to create the only BFA in acting in Maryland. Please welcome Ms. Salkind. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm worried. I'm worried when I read and hear people propose that in the near future we won't need universities because courses will be taught online where students will perform all of their research because that would just be more efficient. I'm worried when I read articles suggesting that we should compress university courses so we provide students with just the essential ideas, like the ones they get when they read online. And I'm angry when I read experts comparing the workings of the mind to a computer. There are many studies being done now examining the speed with which we access so much information and with our multitasking online and how that is affecting our thinking and our brain. And what they're finding is because online information is formatted so that we will be constantly distracted that we are not developing the capacity to read, to remember, and to learn with depth. We are turning into what some researchers are calling shallow thinkers. But our minds do not work like computers. Computers have no capacity for self-reflection. The act of learning is a whole person experience. Learning does not just happen in your brain. Your brain is your nervous system which connects to every muscle and organ in your body. Your nervous system affects your breathing, and breathing is life. And you are also your imagination, and we don't know where that resides in your body. For centuries, every great thinker, writer, artist, scientist, spiritual leader speaks of how true learning occurs in moments of quiet, of least distraction, or when the collaboration with others has a discreet focus. I'm sure you've all had the experience of working on a problem, finding no solution, and the next morning being awakened by an answer. Learning is an active process of making connections. These connections allow you to make choices about who you are and who you in how you interact with the world, but they require mindfulness, 
and mindfulness occurs in the absence of distraction. Let me present you with a scene with which you are familiar. There's always an interesting dynamic that happens early on in a new course. The first day, everyone comes in and just sits down. But by the second day of class, students have clearly established where they want to sit, and they return to the same seat each time they come to class. They enter the class, or you would enter the class, and your body just knows where to go and where you feel comfortable. You've created a new habit. And by their very nature, habits are unconscious, and they always feel right. But if one day the professor comes in and says that the chairs need to be moved into a circle for class, then something really interesting happens. You have to consciously figure out where to sit and who to sit beside. Your body moves differently, and your entire neuromuscular system is on alert. This is what I call a moment of opportunity. You're no longer functioning unconsciously. And if you can stay present in that very attentive state, then an entirely new process of learning will happen. When you leave that class, you'll remember the disruption of the routine, which can allow you to more fully integrate the experience. Functioning within habitual behavior always feels comfortable. When you choose to do something differently, it feels wrong. For example, I'd like you to try something. Leave your hands in your lap, but I want you to intertwine your fingers like this. And without looking at your hands, just be aware of which thumb is on top. Now, still don't look at your hands, but undo your fingers, and now intertwine them again with the other thumb on top. Feels weird, right? Your conscious choice to do something non-habitual keeps you on alert. I teach in the theater department, and in our acting classes, students are told to take risks. We say, don't assume you know the outcome. Stay present with what is happening in the moment. When you are truly present with another human being, you are most receptive and open to learning about that person and about yourself. I suggest to you that this process is the same for those of you who do not train as actors. Learning is about your willingness to live with the discomfort of not knowing and to open yourself to whatever happens within that condition. Here's what I require of the actors with whom I work. Give up trying to get it right. Immerse yourself in what feels confusing, messy, and unrecognizable. And spend some time every day doing something non-habitual. I believe we're here to prove that we do need universities because they encourage us to become more conscious, to fully engage our imaginations, and if we make the choice to discover a way of learning that will allow us to become deep thinkers and more connected human beings. As one of my favorite American writers, Gertrude Stein, said, and in asking a question, one is not answering, but one is, as one may say, deciding about knowing. I wish you luck with your studies, and I hope I get to meet many of you. Thank you. I'd now like to introduce our next speaker, Mr. Curtis Schickner, who will address the benefits of being involved in activities and organizations on campus. Curtis is a junior, majoring in financial economics, with a minor in English. He also is the starting third baseman on UMBC's baseball team, and has been selected to the all-academic team for baseball. He is a member of the Black and Gold Council and secretary of the Student Athlete Advisory Committee. In addition, he mentors a second grader at a local elementary school. Please join me in welcoming Curtis. Thank you, Professor Salkan. And thank you, Dr. Rabowski and Dr. Young for giving me this opportunity to speak today. This is an exciting time of the year. The new school year always brings a wave of anticipation and uncertainty. Two years ago, I sat in those same chairs. 
with my teammate and roommate, Andy, as we listen to the speakers on this stage talk about the opportunities and the responsibilities of the college experience. I arrived at UMBC, like many of you this weekend, not knowing anyone. I spoke with my roommate once or twice, but met him for the first time while moving into our dorm. I came from New Jersey, recruited to play on the varsity baseball team, and knew I wanted to study economics. Beyond that, UMBC was a mystery to me. But over those two years, I've gained some important insight into how my college experiences and my attitudes have grown. Most of you are sitting here today with your roommates or your sweet mates, or perhaps someone you met at the commuter events. You know the person sitting to your left and to your right. You may even know a few people sitting in the row in front of you. What you don't realize is that your best friend in three years is actually sitting across the arena over there. And your future boyfriend or girlfriend may actually be sitting over here. <laughs> your biggest struggle as new students on campus will not be trying to find Lecture Hall 7 or trying to remember your mailbox combination. Surprisingly, it won't be the homework or the test either, both of which we've done since elementary school. What we haven't done is to enter an unfamiliar community and find our niche. Find that initial team, sorority, or community service project with which you will branch out and become a permanent fixture in the UMBC community. My freshman year, I was privileged to come into college, already affiliated with the group, as a member of the baseball team. I attended class with teammates, ate meals with them, and hung out in the evening with my team. I had a group, but my identity and connections on campus were confined to a box. I was a baseball player, and I seldom strayed from that title and from my teammates. Over my first semester, I shied away from opportunities to explore outside of my team and get past the walls of the box. I loved my team and my initial identity at UMBC, but I knew that was only a small part of who I was and what opportunities remained unseen. At the end of the fall semester, my network of friends, involvement, and connections were still contained within that box. It wasn't until February of my freshman year that I started to wander around the edges of the box and discover what was beyond my group. I learned that exploring other interests in college does not mean abandoning your priorities and commitments to studies and teams. It is an extension of your education as a valuable part of the UMBC experience. I didn't immediately jump for my team and blindly explore different groups on campus. I used my friends and connections on the baseball team to start branching out. With Casey as a new roommate, I joined the Student Athlete Advisory Committee and a weekly bowling league to start meeting new friends. I found the most important friend of my life while walking aimlessly through the rack one day. And I followed in the footsteps of upperclassmen and began volunteering through different community outreach programs. DeAndre, an eight-year-old second grade student from Baltimore City, slowly became the highlight of my day. He is the brightest boy in the world, living in an environment without a role model. Through a mentoring program, I visit him two to three times a week at a local elementary school. The impact that I have on his life would have never been felt if I had stayed in my box. In less than a month, I had gone from identifying myself as a baseball player and only exploring that one group, to affiliating with over seven different clubs, groups, and community service projects. My network is still expanding. It is my affiliation with the team that led to openings with other forms of involvement at UMBC. In a minute, you will hear from Caroline and how getting involved in the Baja Club shaped her, shaped her college experience. And you've already heard how Yasmin became involved with the Student Government Association. For some of you, the transition into college will be smooth and transient. But many of you will be looking for the right group and place at UMBC like I did. While you're in that box, you remain lost. But as soon as you step out of your box and get involved, the experience at UMBC is brand new. I hope you don't wait to be pulled out like I did. Go out immediately and find your place at UMBC. 
Good luck tomorrow. Enjoy this semester and the next four years at UMBC. Thank you. Now I am pleased to introduce Ms. Caroline Sheck, who graduated in December with a degree in mechanical engineering. Ms. Sheck is the project manager of our Baja Society of Automotive Engineers team. This year they competed in three international competitions and are currently ranked first in the United States and second in the world. Caroline is working on her master's degree in mechanical engineering here at UMBC. Please welcome Caroline. My name is Caroline Sheck. As was stated, I recently graduated from UMBC with my bachelor's in mechanical engineering. I'm currently here pursuing my graduate degree. During my junior year, a friend and I ran into one of our old TAs and we were invited to attend a meeting for the Society of Automotive Engineers. We went because of the free food and the chance to stop what was turning into a multiple hour study session. However, that night, this club I found out is composed of a team of students that dedicate unheard of amounts of time each year to designing, building, testing, and finally racing a one person off-road vehicle against up to 100 other teams internationally from around the world each year. Our 2010 car, if some of you can see it, is up on the podium, is up on the second level over there. If you can't see it, please take some time afterward too. It's pretty cool. All right, within a month and a half of that first meeting, I had attended my first race and was a member of the team. One year later, we're coming off of our most successful season in the history of UMBC Baja. We competed for the first time at all three North American races and ended the year as the first ranked Baja team in the United States and second in the world. With this accomplishment in mind, I'd like to ask the UMBC Baja SAE team members that have gathered here today to please stand so we can congratulate them as well. What most attracted me to this team is what, is what I saw as the only hands-on, in-depth engineering experience I would ever get as a student. I've gained more skills in modeling, application, and machining besides business areas such as finance, project management, and scheduling that I ever would have in a classroom. More experienced members of the team than I have gone so far as to reverse engineer complicated drivetrain components based off of nothing but photographs from the internet. For those of you that don't speak engineering, that means taking a photograph and building a working model of what's in that photograph based off of nothing but the photograph. With these skill sets, all of our Baja alumni have gone into excellent engineering jobs and members of our team were given a total of five job offers at the races this year. While not all of you are engineering majors, being involved in a club on campus can lead you to become a better professional in your field, help you get into graduate school and can lead to job offers you would have never gotten from just staying in the classroom. And as Curtis mentioned, besides helping your professional career, clubs on campus are an excellent way to meet new people and become part of the community that is UMBC. Thank you. <laughs> Through the Baja team, I have received many unique opportunities. And now I am honored to have the opportunity, opportunity to introduce Dr. Rabowski. <laughs> Dr. Rabowski has served as president since 1992, bringing great energy, vision, and leadership to the university. In 2008, he was named one of America's best leaders by US News and World Report. And in 2009, Time Magazine named him one of America's 10 best college presidents. 
He has been instrumental in connecting UMBC with companies, foundations, agencies, and individuals who helped us launch to sing such programs as the Sondheim Public Affairs, Linehan Artist, and Meyerhoff Scholars programs for high-achieving students. Dr. Rabowski also is known for taking a personal interest in all UMBC students. Don't be surprised if he stops you while you are walking or in an elevator and asks you what grade you earned on your last exam. He is dedicated to ensuring that all students reach their goals and achieve their potential. Please join me in welcoming our president, Dr. Freeman Rabowski. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you. Incredible. Absolutely. Young people, I am inspired today as I listen to a young woman who was very shy just two or three years ago and now is one of the most outstanding presidents of student governments in the country. As I listen to a young man who's a great baseball player who has the courage to go out and work with little children from Baltimore City. Give him a hand. As I listen to a young woman introducing the great members of the national team and as she is a pioneer in engineering, give her a hand for that. And as I reflected upon what one of my heroes, Wendy Salkine, said about teaching you to think differently and to use your thumbs to make the point about how easy it is to get into a habit and to be present in the moment. Give her a hand for that also. And finally, my colleagues, Provost and Vice Provost, Dr. Hirschman and Dr. Dr. I look around, who was it? Dr. Lee, Dr. Diane Lee. Give them both a hand, please, for, for their work. I will talk from my speech today. I'm going to encourage you to read it. I'm not going to read the entire speech. You have been very impressive in listening carefully as freshmen and some transfer students. The fact is that I don't think any skill will be more important to you as you go through this next period than being able to listen carefully. And sometimes you'll get tired of sitting and people will be talking. But the more you can listen, the more you get a chance to evaluate what others have said and to think about what you like, what you don't like, to understand different perspectives. I begin with words from Olive Schreiner, a British missionary in South Africa, words that I was given as a child and I offer to you, them to you today. May you seek after truth. If anything I teach you be false, May you throw it from you and go on to richer knowledge and deeper truth than I have ever known. If you become a man or woman of thought and learning, may you never fail to tear down with your right hand what your left hand has built up. If through years of thought and study, you see it at last not to be founded on that which is. If you become an artist, May you never paint with pen or brush any picture of external life otherwise than as you see it. In all of your circumstances, my child, may you seek after truth and cling to that as a drowning man in a stormy sea who flings himself on a plank and clings to it knowing that whether he sinks or swims, it is the best that he has. Thy poor, unknown, a failure, but shut your eyes to nothing that seems to them to be the truth. I remember learning those words as a child in my church, in a youth fellowship, and my minister, my late beloved minister who came here when I became president in 93, said those words, and it occurred to me that all of my life, I had been struggling to live by those words. And so I begin today with the suggestion that you take the words and use them as a beacon as you begin your journey. The word convocation means a calling together in Latin, and we call you together to welcome you, 
to let you know you are now a part of this community and that we care. We are very excited that you're here. You see people all around you. You see people standing up around. They don't have to be here. They wanted to be here to let you know that they care. You see the faculty and staff sitting on both sides. What you may not know is that these people have sacrificed a lot for several years with outraises, with furloughs, and yet what has been foremost in the thinking of our faculty and staff, in spite of financial sacrifices, we want to do a great job with our students. And so give our faculty and staff, if you would, a round of applause for what they do. Very nice. My message today is one that I give every year. It is that the way you think about yourselves, students, the language that you use, whatever it is that is really important to you, your values, will determine not only who you are today, but who you will be in the future. Many of you have been reading the paper and you've seen the talk about race to the top and this notion of competition with other countries and the challenge that we face because we're not increasing the percentage of people graduating from college. The fact is that when looking at people over 25, we have been very fortunate from 25 up until about 70, Americans were leading the world in college graduates. The only country with a higher percentage was, was Canada. And it's all college degrees, four-year degrees, two-year degrees, and beyond. The fact is that about 39% of people had either a four-year degree or a double A from community colleges. And in Canada, it's about 41%. The problem we face is that for younger people, we are not increasing those numbers while other countries are substantially moving ahead. And so we have dropped to position number seven. And everyone knows that our ability to be as strong as a nation will in large part be directly related to our ability to educate more and more of our citizens. And what does that mean for you? The fact is that we know that many people start off in college and yet only about half graduate. From some institutions, is only about a third. Our goal is, as you know, to make sure you excel. And students today said to me something very interesting. They made the comment that they have heard me say something about looking to your left and looking to your right, right? Well, let's do it for a minute. I remember years ago when I was in college, 40-some years ago as a freshman, that the dean said, and I want you to do this now. Look at the student to your left. Now look at the student to your right. Okay, when your parents and your faculty and staff were in college, the dean said, one of you will not graduate. All right? Now, if I'm at all insecure, or if I know I'm not as serious as I need to be, I'm going to say, oh my God, they're talking about me. I may as well party and have a good time because I'm not going to be here next year anyway. Not a good message. Not a good message. Self-fulfilling prophecy. But we say this. Look at the student to your left. One more time. Look at the student to your right. Our goal is to make sure all three of you graduate, and if you don't, we fail, and we don't plan to fail. Give yourselves a hand for graduating. And so we have you here today. We invited you here. We are doing all of what we're doing with orientation to get you acclimated to this environment, to say to you, we will work with you to make sure you do the things you need to do to excel, not only to succeed, but to excel. I asked the students in the group where Greg Simmons and I were working with students in the, in the book discussion, what should I say to the new students? And this is what they said. They said, tell them it's going to be OK. You're going to do just fine as long as you work hard and take some time to relax. It's the balance. Work hard, take some time to relax. Tell them not to stress out. Again, it's going to be OK. You'll be all right. Use the resources that are all around you. Remember they said that your goal is in the future and you may have to take different paths to get to your goal. Be flexible enough to find those paths that are most important. And then they said, get the right balance between your long range goals and understanding you must live every day. Sort of like what Professor Salkan was saying, be present in the moment. Take advantage every day, every experience, every class. And then they said, never give up, very important. And as was said in the translator, as Daoud said, 
understand the importance of overcoming your fears. Whatever your fears are, you're going to have to overcome them, and you can do that. And finally, the best piece of advice of all, they said, talk to the Woolies, because they're very helpful. Give the Woolies a hand, would you? You all read the book, you listened to the book, you, you listened to Hari as he talked, the courage that that man had as he told his story, as you got a chance to see suffering up close, as you thought about one person's inhumanity to another, the notion that people can be very comfortable when they are not around the suffering, it's hard to, to watch and to see the suffering, to see a child killed, the idea that it's hard to be courageous, the special notion that it takes a selfless person to be willing to reach out to other people, the idea that it's important to learn to think and to communicate in order to reach one's goals. You know, it was amazing to see his lust for learning and the way he talked about books from Brunty's, Jane Eyre to, Jane, to Charles Dickens, Oliver Twist to Orwell's Animal Farm, to even talking about Cry the Beloved Country, Alan Patton. The idea was this. He said, these books changed me and opened and freed my mind, as the provost said about a liberal education. Well, the purpose of our getting you to read the book was to build community, was to get you to think about people beyond yourselves, to listen to someone else's stories. And the purpose of your education is to give you a chance to learn to think broadly, to communicate effectively, to feel for other people, to understand your own story, to appreciate the stories of others, and to get beyond your comfort zone. How many of you have met at least 10 people you didn't know before you came to UMBC? Good. Keep getting to know people from different backgrounds. It's very important. You know, and keep asking questions. I often quote a Nobel laureate, Izzy. Uh, it's amazing that uh, years ago, I. I. Robbie, a Nobel laureate, said that when he was growing up in New York, all of his friends' parents would ask them at the end of every school day, what did you learn in school? He said, but not my Jewish mother. My Jewish mother said, Izzy, did you ask a good question today? And he said, the practice of her encouraging his curiosity made him the thinker he became. But we want to encourage you to ask good questions. One of our challenges is that America is known for its creativity and innovation, and yet, one of the criticisms right now is that we're not working to teach young people to think deeply, to learn to be as creative as possible. The more you get out of the habits, as was said earlier, that you have, the more you question, the more confusing things can be sometimes, the more you get a chance to think critically and rethink how you do things. I would argue that you are older today than you think you are. Many of you are 17 and 18, some are older, but the fact is that within a very short period of time, you will be doing work that may be affecting children, that may be help affecting healthcare, you may be in labs, you may be learning how to use your craft in the arts, but you will be doing things that are preparing you for the rest of your lives. You want to follow your passion. How many of you, quite frankly, don't know what you want to do yet? Tell the truth. How many of you don't know what you want to major in? It's perfectly okay. One of the advantages of being at an institution that focuses on the liberal arts is you have a chance to dive in, to learn about different things, from the arts and humanities to the social sciences, science, engineering, all those areas. You will find your way. Just relax, open your minds, be as creative as you can possibly be. I want you to be encouraged to work with others. How many of you are accustomed to working in groups? We encourage you to work in groups, whether in study sessions or labs, in performances, in civic engagement, on the floors in the residence halls, to work in clubs and all kinds of organizations. Let me take a minute and congratulate all the different groups at UMBC that have done well. I especially want to congratulate the swimming and diving teams. We had American East Championships this year. Give them a big hand, would you? Swimming and diving. And I want to congratulate the chess team, national champions. Give us a big hand for that. And I want to congratulate the cybersecurity team. They did really well, fourth on the East Coast this year. 
and the great theatrical productions throughout the year. Big deal. I want you to go to the theatrical productions. And the dance performances, give them a hand, all the different dance groups on campus. And the UMBC Orchestra, big hand for them, please. And the amazing Camarata, they did a great job wherever they were. They were really good today. And the groups go on and on and on. I want a, one team that you wouldn't think about because it's a different kind of index, and yet I'm so proud of them. This year, we made the top 20, one of the top 25 teams in the National Division I uh, uh, group. That's the top group for academic performance, women's basketball. Give them a big hand for that. The point I'm making is there are all kinds of groups you can be a part of. You have the opportunity to get to know people from 150 countries. One of the ways you can, you can just walk around and see that people are different and not take advantage of it. But when you walk across the stage in the next few years, I want you to be able to tell me two things. Number one, you've met people from all kinds of backgrounds. And number two, you are ready to change the world. It makes all the difference in the world. The fact is that this is the time when your character comes through. Some of you know I always close with something about character. Your character has everything to do with who you are when nobody, when you don't think anybody's watching. What will you do when your mother isn't there, right? You can do whatever you want to do, what will you do? I, every year now, talk for a moment about the recent statistics involving alcohol and drugs. I say, why would I do that? Well, this year, we're at higher statistics than ever before. The fact is that in America, there were more accidents associated with college students, more accidents and injuries than ever before. How many do you think there were? Anybody have any idea? 600,000. 600,000 students were injured because of, because of alcohol. How many people do you think were assaulted, students by students? because of alcohol, 700,000 fights in America. How many sexual assaults and date rapes do you think because of alcohol? 100,000. And then the saddest of all, I want you to listen. And I see some people laughing. I see some people laughing. In college, we don't do that. Very different from high school. We care so much about you, we expect you to be young adults, always. We respect each other, right? This is serious business. I want you to hear me when I say this. Every day in America, five college students looking like you die from alcohol poisoning. And so the matter is one of life and death. Do you know that so many weekends, Dr. Young or some of our colleagues will text me or email me or call me because we have had to rush another student to the hospital, right up to St. Agnes, simply because they are unconscious. And what you may not know is if somebody has gotten that drunk and you say, let me just let him sleep it off, let her sleep it off, the fact is that the person has a great chance of dying. And so our only choice when they lose consciousness is to rush them to the hospital and hope they won't die. You know, when you're young, you don't think it's possible for things like that to happen. And yet I hope you hear me today that it's so important to think carefully about what you do. And with that said, I want to leave you with some inspiration. A year ago, one of our freshmen who had been through this experience found himself not feeling well. And when he was finally diagnosed and he got to the health center and when we found out we needed to get him some help, it turned out that he had acute lymphocytic leukemia at age 18. He spent the entire year undergoing treatment, battling the disease. He lost an enormous amount of weight. I got to know him, and we began emailing. He was so passionate about his education that he took several courses online in the midst of being sick, in the midst of having to sleep sometimes for hours and hours and hours, in the midst of all of what goes through when you go through chemo, it's a painful experience. 
but he was determined to make it. And he was constantly sending me emails. And I took his emails and I sent them around the country to people because he kept inspiring me, he made me cry, he made me laugh. And I just kept pulling for him because he was determined not only to get better, he was determined to run a race by the spring. You know, and he was working, when, when sometimes he'd go to the mall and he couldn't even walk for five minutes. And so he has been to hell and back. And it's amazing, it's absolutely amazing that he became stronger and stronger as time went on. And then the other thing that happened that was really interesting is that he began to have some philosophy about what should be said. And he said several things. He said, I said, tell me what I should tell the freshmen. And he said this. He said, tell them to never let themselves be discouraged, that bad things are going to happen to all of us, but, and you can't control that. But rather than let them get themselves down, that you students must learn to overcome the obstacles. Every disaster, he said, has a blessing hidden, hidden within it. It is our failures and, tra and, tra and tragedies that spark change in us. So make sure to make the most of them when they come along. Also, make the most of every moment. It's what Professor Salkheim was saying about being present in the moment. Take that moment. Be there with that moment. And always give yourself something to look forward to. No matter how tough life gets, you will pull through. And at 2 this morning, he knew I was speaking today. And he said he was just thinking about lessons he's learned. And here are those seven lessons, and they'll be on the web. This whole speech will be on the web. He said, never say never. Some things may seem impossible, but by refusing to accept this, I will maintain a positive outlook and won't miss opportunities. Number two, always keep faith. Hope is fuel for the soul and will keep me going whenever everything else seems to fail. Number three, always persevere. Sometimes failure is unavoidable, but at least I will better myself if I go as far as possible. Number four, never forget. The lessons of the past will become the catalyst of the future. Number five, take pride in every endeavor, but don't be boastful. Hubris, hubris is a flaw. Number six, do what you want and follow your own path. Reject the put downs of others. It's easy to be discouraged into taking the easy route but don't do it. And finally, dare to dream, and above all this, pursue those dreams become, bec until they become a reality. Well, his dream was to get back to UMBC as a healthy young man. And today, Jimmy is here with us. I'm gonna ask him to stand, and I want you to let him know how proud we are and inspired by Jimmy Nunley. Jimmy, would you stand, please? Inspiring, Jimmy, and I would say, Jimmy, that as you talk to people, Jimmy has great philosophy of life. When you get a chance, talk to Jimmy. It's when people have gone through challenges, as you all will, as we all will, that we become stronger and we can help other people. And so, students, I challenge you to watch your thoughts, they become your words. Watch your words, they become your actions. Watch your actions, they become your habits. Watch your habits, they become your character. Watch your character, it becomes your destiny. Welcome to UMBC, the journey begins. Thank you. And now, Vice President for Student Affairs, Dr. Nancy Young. Thank you, Dr. Hrabowski. We have reached the pinning ceremony, the part of our convocation where we formally welcome you to the UMBC community. In order to be here today, each of you presented the qualifications and academic preparation necessary not only to be admitted to UMBC, but to excel here. Since accepting your offer of admission, you have attended orientation met classmates at Playfair, the commuter retreat, or perhaps the transfer student network. 
shared ideas at the book discussion, and participated in a variety of Welcome Week activities. These programs were designed not only to help with your transition, but to transmit our traditions, our values, and our high expectations. Through participating in these events, you learned that UMBC is a place where we value academic excellence, a place where each of us is expected to take action to improve the community we now share, a place where all members are welcome and treated with dignity and respect, and a place where members conduct themselves with integrity. You learned that at UMBC, the key to academic and personal success is active involvement both inside and outside of the classroom. The words shared by our convocation speakers have all in some way illustrated and reinforced these values, as well as our hopes and dreams for your future. If you look to your right, you will see the Leave Your Mark Leave Your Mark art banner, created by you as a symbol of your passion, enthusiasm, and pride in black and gold. This banner is han hanging in the arena today and will hang in the commons for the next four years as a symbol of our promise to help you reach your full potential and as a reminder to each of you to reach high as well. Like the banner, the pin you received as you entered the rack today is a symbol of our commitment to support you. Shaped like the paw of True Grit, our Chesapeake Bay Retriever mascot, the pin in your hand is also a sign of your commitment to the responsibilities and expectations that you accept as a member of the UMBC community. The pin you now hold in your hand serves always as a reminder of our shared values, traditions, and expectations. By accepting this pin, you pledge to make the most of your education while striving to uphold our highest ideals. Having learned of our values, our traditions, and expectations, and having indicated your desire to join this community by attending this ceremony today, there is only one joyous thing remaining for us to do. Dr. Rabowski, will you join me at the podium for our pinning ceremony? All right. This is, this is in a few years, we're doing commencement just like that, That's right? That's right. Mm -hmm. New students, please stand to accept this pledge while holding in your hand the pin you received as you entered the Retriever Activity Center. Dr. Rabowski? Dr. Young. Faculty and staff, returning students who are here to support you, our resident staff, Woolies, Student Athletic Councils, Greek Councils, and a variety of others. I have the honor of presenting the entering class of 2010 and ask you to join me in recognizing them as full members of UMBC with all privileges and responsibilities associated with this membership. Students, I now invite you to proudly place your pin on your shirt as a sign that you are now and forever a part of the extended UMBC family on campus, throughout Maryland, and around the world. Please place your pins. Congratulations to the class of 2010. We ask that you remain standing and invite the faculty, staff, and returning students to rise while our talented students lead us in the singing of our alma mater. The, the, the words are in the yellow program you received or was on your chair. Right, in the black.
Congratulations again. Keep standing to all the new members of the UMBC community. We welcome you and we're delighted you're here. We wish for you nothing but the best. Following today's ceremony, I invite you to celebrate the start of the academic year by attending the free community picnic, a lot of food outside the quad. Please remain, remain seated, I mean, remain, yes, or standing as Dr. Topoleski leads us in the receptional. This is getting you ready for commencement in just a few years, all right? So please remain seated. Give yourselves a hand, another big round of hands. Yeah. I envy all of you, you're in, you're in store for a heck of a ride. Please remain standing until the platform party and the faculty and staff have recessed so we can get the food first. And welcome to UMBC. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.